Hallelujah. Well, bless the Lord. Thank you for coming out today. And uh, we believe that the Word of God will be a blessing to you today as we look at it and as we study it together. Got some good things to look at. Um, let's hold the Word up as we, as we like to do. Hold the Word up. Praise the Lord and say, this is the Word of God. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. I receive the light. I believe the word of God because it is impossible for God to lie. Amen. Thank you so much. Lord bless you. And thank God for his word. Well, if you have those Bibles, let's turn over here to the book of the prophet Isaiah. The book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9. Isaiah, chapter 9. And we'll start here at verses uh, 6. Well, we will read verses 6 and 7. Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. While you're turning there, of course, I want to tell you that, uh, as you know, this is the first Sunday of the month. It's, it is our Holy Communion Sunday. And uh, typically on Holy Communion Sunday, I share something from the Word relative to communion. Well, and, and that will be our practice also going forward. But this is not only the first Sunday of the month. As you know, this happens to be the first Sunday of December. It's hard to believe. But this is the first Sunday of December. And as such, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Ghost to take the month of December. I will have three Sundays. We have five Sundays in the month. But I will have three Sundays leading up to Christmas. The fourth will be our Christmas program, so I won't have a, a full message that day. But I have three Sundays leading up to Christmas to share some things along the line about the birth of our Savior. And so we're going to take these three Sundays and look at some things about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now... For we as believers, this time of year should point to Jesus. It should be about him. Now, let's look at that chapter 9 of Isaiah, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, and the word of God says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, this prophecy is about, of course, our Messiah King who would be born. The prophet said this Messiah King would have five names. And five, by the way, in biblical numerics is the number of grace. Five names. Now, we could spend really significant time on all these names, these titles, these characteristics of our great Messiah King. For example, we could preach a sermon or two on his name shall be called Wonderful. Hallelujah. We, we, we could then preach several on counselor and mighty God. In fact, we could preach forever on these phrases and never exhaust or really plumb the depths of them. Jesus is all of them and even more. In this message today and next week as well, Lord willing, we will consider the phrase, his name shall be called wonderful 
Notice that what the prophet says. He says, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. You see, the, you see, the physical body of Jesus was born. But his eternal spirit, which existed in the beginning, in the dateless past, with the Father and created all things, was given. The spiritual being of Jesus wasn't created, but it was given into a sinless, nonetheless, human body of a baby. At Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of that baby. But can I tell you, and I think we all know this, but if all we had was him being born and that was the end of it, there'd be no plan of salvation. There'd be no redemption for fallen humanity. Let's take a look at God's plan from beginning to end. I want you to know, first of all, his childhood was wonderful. He was wonderful in ministry. He was wonderful in his death. He was wonderful in his resurrection. And thank God one day he will be wonderful in his coming again. Hallelujah. All of this can be seen in connection with the Christmas story. We'll let the scriptures speak for themselves today. First of all, I want you to notice he was wonderful in conception and the announcement of his birth. Look with me in your Bibles over at Luke's Gospel. Now you're familiar with all of these passages of Scripture. You've heard them many times. But let's come over here to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 26, starting. I'll read more Scripture today than I ordinarily would, but we're letting the Word speak to us today, praise the Lord. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the cousin of Mary. Um, now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man, or as it says in the margin, am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. He says in verse 37, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Hallelujah. Well, you know what? An announcement of a baby is always such a joyous occasion. It's a glorious occasion. I mean, there are, there are birth announcements handed out. There are uh, showers that are held, baby showers. It's such a, a wonderful occasion, such a joyous time, such a wonderful thing when it's announced that a baby's on the way. But I want to tell you, there has never been a birth announcement as wonderful as this one. It was so wonderful that an angel, the Bible said, is sent down to bring it. But I want you to notice, though, not only was he wonderful in the announcement of his birth, but he was wonderful in his conception. 
Look at verse 31 again. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Dropping again down to verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man that is, I am a virgin. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy Spirit one who is to be born will be called the son of God verse 37 for with God nothing will be impossible see when Zacharias the father of John the Baptist when he was told that his wife Elizabeth who had been barren that she would have a child you'll recall that Zacharias doubted he responded in doubt. Mary does not respond in doubt. Mary did not doubt this could happen, that which the angel was telling her. She didn't even doubt that it would happen. She just wondered about the how. How is this going to happen? Mary was a chaste virgin, and she had never been with a man. So she's saying, how can this be that I will conceive in my womb and bear this child? How, how's this going to be? Well, how's this going to be carried out? See, Mary understood that a conception cannot occur without a seed. Conception cannot occur without seed, and the conception of Jesus was no exception in that sense. The difference was, however, the source of the seed. See, the seed that led to the conception of Jesus was not from a human father. It was not from a man. It was not through the normal process of procreation and biology. No, it was a completely supernatural event. It was the difference in the source of the seed. Now, I'd like to have you mark your place just a moment. In Luke's gospel, let's come back here. Mark your place in Luke 1. We're going to come back there. But come with me quickly over here to the book of beginnings. I'm talking about, of course, the book of Breshith, I'm talking about the book of Genesis. Let's come back to Genesis chapter 3, to the very first prophecy in the Word of God. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, and the Bible says, And I will put enmity, that is division, that is strife, I will put enmity between you and the woman, that is the serpent and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This was the very first prophecy in the word of God. In fact, in theology, it's referred to by the Latin title Proto-Evangelium. Proto-Evangelium in Latin, that prefix proto means first evangelium speaks of the gospel and so proto-evangelium would be the first gospel this is the gospel genesis 3 15 in a capsule form it talked about this one who would be born uh, supernaturally, who would crush the head of the serpent in comparison, even though the serpent would hurt the seed of the woman. Ultimately, it would be just a matter of bruising his heel, whereas the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. But I want you to notice this set up the classic cosmic battle of the seeds. On one hand, you had the seed of the serpent and you had the seed of the woman. Now, if we had time, which we do not, if we had time, we would go in to tell you how this seed of the serpent has manifested itself through the years. That'll be a different time. But I want to talk about this one that is referred to as the seed of the woman. Wait a minute. 
The woman doesn't have seed. And yet he said, her seed. The woman doesn't have seed, but the prophecy said, her seed. I want you to think about, we're not going to go there right now, but I want you to think about the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. In fact, if I am looking at a translation of the scriptures, I always look at, this is one of the passages I always look at, because if a translation gets Isaiah 7, 14 wrong, you can't trust them about other things. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Behold, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. King James Version says, A virgin shall conceive, but it's actually the definite article there, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Hallelujah. And we know that means God with us. And so that was a prophecy the virgin would conceive. Well, guess what? Fast forward uh, 700 and some years past the prophecy of Isaiah, and we find a little virgin Jewish girl in a city called Nazareth, and the angel Gabriel is sent to her, and he tells her she is going to conceive in her womb and bear a son. But guess what? Back at Luke chapter 1 now. Back at Luke chapter 1. Remember Mary had said, how's this going to happen? I'm talking about Jesus was wonderful in his conception. How's this going to happen? The angel answered, and, and we read this before, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Isn't that glorious? Yeah. Aren't you glad to know with God nothing shall be impossible? With God, nothing shall be impossible. Oh, but I want you to look at that word, nothing. Oh, that word, nothing, is a wonderful word. Somebody says, well, we know what the word nothing means, Pastor Kevin. The word nothing means nothing. Nothing shall be impossible. You want to break it up? It's no thing shall be impossible with God. We know that. What can be in that word? Oh, there's a lot in it. And, and really, our English translation doesn't catch this. All there are a few that do, like the Rotherham uh, Emphasized Bible, the New Testament and Expanded Translation uh, by Kenneth S. Weiss, the Montgomery New Testament catches this, uh, comes about the closest to catching what the Greek text says. The Amplified Bible does a great job as well, but in Greek, nothing translates two words. The first word is no. It's no in Greek as well. No. And the second part of the word translated nothing is the Greek word rhema. And so what is actually in the Greek text? The angel says, for with God, no rhema shall be impossible. No word that issues forth from the mouth of God, no promise of God, nothing God says, no statement from God, no spoken word, that's what rhema is, no spoken word from God will be empty or void of power to bring about its own fulfillment. Hallelujah. There is sufficient power, there is sufficient power in every promise of God, every word of God. There is sufficient power in everything that issues forth from the word of God to make it come to pass. You don't have to help God. You don't have to push him along. You don't try to have to figure it out yourself. No, no promise from God is impossible. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo, hallelujah. That's what he said. No word from God shall be void of power. And he says, the power of the highest will overshadow you. And that word overshadow 
is the same word that we find in the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel where the Bible says a bright cloud overshadowed them. It's speaking of the, as it is literally in Hebrew, the Shekinah. The, we usually say Shekinah. But the very glory of God, he says, will overshadow you like a cloud. And so this thing that is about to happen to you, Mary... This conception is going to be entirely a supernatural work of God. It will not be of the flesh. It will be by the power of God. Hallelujah. You notice what Mary says in verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to to your word and what it says there is let it be unto me according to your rhema Woo. she received that rhema word from god and that word now we know now boy if we had the time we'd really explore this and show you how the bible makes it very clear that the word is a seed but I'm telling you, the word of God itself is a seed. And that seed of the rhema word of God is what Mary received by faith. And that seed of the word, she conceived the seed of the word in her. And nine months later, the word that she, was, that she received was born. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. God, and the word was God. Hallelujah. Woo, my, my, my. My, my, my. My, my, my. Hallelujah. Look at verse 38. We just read it. Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Now, now, Luke chapter 2, we're not going to go there, but it tells us that Mary didn't tell anyone of this angelic visit. She didn't go out and tell her neighbors. She didn't go out and tell her friends. She didn't go out and tell Joseph. And she hadn't told Elizabeth. The Bible says she pondered these things in her heart. But look what happens here in verse 41. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. That is John the Baptist in her womb, six months along in pregnancy. The babe leaped in her womb. And the Bible says, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women. All right, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary hadn't said anything to her. This was by revelation. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, hallelujah, talking about his, his, he was wonderful in conception. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. Did Mary need a savior? Yep. And rejoiced in God, my savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on all those who fear him from generation to generation. For he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away with 
uh, was sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. I'm telling you, he was glorious. He was wonderful in the announcement of his birth. He was wonderful in his conception. Come over here to Luke's gospel, just across the page, chapter 1. Let's reminisce about this beautiful passage of scripture this time of year. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, that is, all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Listen, this, 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 uh, this ruler of, of, of Rome, this ruler uh, of Israel uh, under the auspices of the Roman government, he didn't know what he was doing. He, he, he didn't know why it came into his heart all of a sudden to have this taxation and this census. But all of a sudden he found himself doing it and it required everyone to return to the city of their birth. And guess what? Joseph Joseph was of the lineage of David. Mary was of the lineage of David. So, so they had to go to Bethlehem. Well, the prophet had said he would be born in Bethlehem. I'm telling you, God can bring his word to pass. Hallelujah. But watch this. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, great with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, or as it says in the margin, in a feed trough, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now were the, there were there in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Guess what? Here comes an angel announcing his birth to these shepherds. He was wonderful in the announcement of his birth. He was wonderful in conception, but watch this. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling claws, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said one to another, Let us go into Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered him in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told them. My, my, my. He was glorious. He was wonderful and in the announcement of his birth. It was so wonderful, angels were sent to announce it to Mary. It was so wonderful, angels, a multitude of the heavenly host, were sent to a group of shepherds in the field to announce that he had been born. Oh, but I've got to hurry. He was also wonderful in ministry. The announcement of Jesus' birth certainly was wonderful, 
But Luke 2.40, if we look at that, Luke 2.40 tells us, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. It tells us he was wonderful in his childhood. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about the childhood of Jesus, but he was wonderful in his childhood. It skips ahead when he was about 12 years old, so we're not going to try to fill in the blanks. But later, he was wonderful in ministry. And usually, when we think about the ministry of Jesus, we think about healing the sick. We think about opening uh, blind eyes. We think about unstopping deaf ears. We think about casting devils out in those wonderful works of power. And he certainly did that. But I want you to see over in Matthew's gospel, over in Matthew's gospel, chapter nine, I want you to see something here. Matthew's gospel, chapter nine. I'm not sure I'm going to get everything I had planned in today, but that's all right. Praise the Lord. We're not going to get too excited. That's why I made it a two-parter. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Matthew 9, 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages. I want you to notice this. Matthew 9, 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. See, we need to think about all of Jesus' ministry because his ministry consisted in words and works. Words and works. Jesus said in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the works that I do shall you do also, because I go unto my Father. Hallelujah. Jesus' ministry consisted of teaching, preaching, healing. And I want you to know our ministry should consist of the same things. Yeah. Huh? Luke 4.14, we'll not go there for the sake of time, but Luke 4.14 tells us something else about Jesus' ministry. After 40 days fasting in the desert and overcoming the temptation of the devil as a man with the word of God, bless the Lord. Uh, it says in Luke 4.14 that he returned. Now, he went into the wilderness Filled with the Spirit. And the Bible says in Luke 4.14 4, that he returned in the power of the Spirit. So Jesus did what he did, not as God, although he was God, never ceased at one moment to be God. And yet he ministered as a man filled with and anointed by the Holy Ghost. He returned in the power of the Spirit. See, he was wonderful in ministry. His ministry consisted first of teaching, then preaching. And finally, healing. You will find that if you study through the Gospels, that Jesus did more teaching. If you underline every time you read teaching or taught in the Gospels, you will find that he did more teaching than anything else. Jesus was wonderful, wonderful in ministry, wonderful in words, and wonderful in works. His name shall be called wonderful. But lastly... He was wonderful in his death. You know, if it had ended with his ministry, if all he did was travel around and preach and teach and heal the sick, as great as that was, if the story had ended there, there would be no new birth. Had, had the story ended there, there would be no redemption. Had the story ended there, there would have been no remission for our sins. But thank God, he was also wonderful in his death. See, Jesus took our place. He was our substitute. He became what we were so we could become what he is. And you'll recall at that moment, Jesus hung on the cross. And the Bible says that Jesus cried out that bitter cry prophesied in, in uh, uh, Psalm 22 and verse 1. He said, my God, my God, 
Why hast thou forsaking me? It's Elo, Elo, Lama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And at that moment on the cross, he became separated from the Father. He had never been separated from the Father from eternity past, right up into that time. He had never known anything but sweet communion with the Father. And yet, as he hung on that cross, I want you to understand that Jesus never was a sinner. Jesus never committed sin. Jesus never missed the mark. But what did he do? Well, what he did is he became sin with our sin. That is, he absorbed our sin into that pure, spotless body. And since the Father cannot look on sin, he for a time could not look on his own son because his own son was taking our place and he became separated from the Father. The Bible tells us from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness over the face of the earth as, as God could literally not look on sin. It was shrouded in darkness during that period of time of separation for Jesus when he took our place. Whoo, hallelujah, hallelujah. Matthew chapter 27, let me go there quickly. Matthew 27, whoo, hallelujah. Thank God for his word, amen. Matthew 27, verse 48. Matthew 27, verse 48. Let's look at what the word says. Matthew 27, 48 says immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge. This, Jesus is on the cross here. Filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Jesus had said, Elo, Elo, Elama, Sabachthani. They thought he was calling for Elijah. He was not. But the Bible says, let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. That is, his spirit and his soul left his body. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. My, my, my. See, he was wonderful in his death. Real quickly, I've got to tell you, it was very significant, it is very significant, that the veil of the temple was torn. See, under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, that veil separated the holy place from the most holy place. And the very glory of God dwelt on that mercy seat between those two cherubim. And it was veiled off. The average person could not go in there. The Levites could not go in there. In fact, the only one who could go to that place beyond that veil was the high priest once a year on the day of Yom Kippur, the great day of atonement, he could go in that place and he did so with great precaution because he was stepping in to the very presence of God to represent the people before God. And so he'd go once a year. Ah, but on that day when Jesus yielded up his spirit, the Bible says that that veil was torn. Unless you think maybe it was a little curtain. Mm -mm. It wasn't a little curtain. Unless you think it maybe was like a bed sheet. No. In fact, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus tells us that that veil was 20 feet high. Uh, he, he told us it was 20 feet high. It was 40 feet wide. And it was 4 feet thick. Wow, 20 feet high, 40 feet wide, 4 feet thick, and the Bible says, in fact, Josephus also, not the Bible, but Josephus said that wild oxen, two teams of oxen, could not part that veil, but I'm telling you, an angel or another emissary from heaven on the day in which Jesus lived, 
yielded his spirit. The Bible says that that veil was torn not from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom, 20 feet in the air. An angel came down or some emissary from heaven came down and tore that veil in two letting in the saying once and for all that the glory of God, God's presence is no longer cut off from the people. And now the presence of God, the glory of God no longer dwells in man-made temples, no longer dwells in a tabernacle of, of, of material or animal skin. Thank God, but the very glory of God, when we make Jesus the Lord of our life, the glory of God, the person of the Holy Spirit, Spirit comes in and makes his abode in us. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God now isn't shut up apart from you, but that now God lives in you. God is with you. God is around you. And I'm telling you, just like the songwriter said, now he walks with me. He talks with me and he tells me I am his own. I'm telling you, Jesus was wonderful in his death. In his death, the redemption price was paid. In his death, the redemption price that he did pay is what we remember when we partake of Holy Communion. You probably wondered how I was going to lead into that. It's, it's what we remember when we partake of Holy Communion. His wonderful death was the price paid for your redemption and my redemption. Jesus gave these elements to, to us to teach us and remind us of what he did for us. Now, I want to remind you that the Bible says on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had taken bread, he broke it and said, this is my body. This do in remembrance of me, the Bible says that he took the cup and after supper, and he said, this is the cup and the new covenant of my blood, drink ye all of it. And see, these two elements that we, we observe, it is to stir our pure minds by way of remembrance. Yes, the price that Jesus paid for our sins with his blood, but let us never forget the benefit of his broken body represented by the blood by the bread because by his stripes you were healed in that redemption price that Jesus paid he made provision for sin he made provision for sickness and disease and everything that sin brought into the earth realm and so we partake of it today now um, I am going to here's what I'm going to do I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just serve you myself today. I just want to serve you. So I'm going to, I'm going to serve you the element. And sister, yeah, thank you for coming to the piano. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, go ahead and tell them to come up. Brother, tell them to come on up. Praise the Lord. I'm going to take my, my, my bread here. Well, I'll just take it. Praise, thank you. He went to that cross. Oh, we remember him going to that cross. We read about it. Hallelujah. But as
as we partake of it together, this is the, the emblem. I'm going to minister to you now the element of his shed blood. I know this takes a little longer, but I just wanted to serve you today. And so we take it to uh, represent what Jesus did. And uh, so, first of all, we have the element of his broken body. And of course, the Bible says that Jesus took bread. Like we said a moment ago, after he had broken, he said, take, eat, this is my body. So we partake of this element that represents the broken body of Jesus by faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And the Bible says that he took bread. Now, I didn't say this earlier, but uh, in fact, I need to uh, make sure Josiah gets his bread. I gave him that. Okay, praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Thank you for doing that. All right. Anyway, the Bible says he took the cup, and he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it. And, of course, represents the price that Jesus paid for our sins. And so let's by faith partake of the element of his shed blood. Amen. Now the Bible says on that first night, wait, gather those for me, brother. The Bible says on that night, they were gathered at the, they were gathered at the Seder table. They were um, having Passover. This was instituted in the context of Passover. But, but the word says that after they had eaten, the Bible says that they sung a hymn. And uh, that was, you were playing the old rugged cross, right? Okay. Let's, let, 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 let's uh, pick up there with, um, on a hill far away, they will do one course. Praise the Lord. Well, on a hill far away, Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Hallelujah. How I love that old cross, the dearest and best, for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish or cling to. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross To my trophies at last I lay down I will cling, I will cling to the old rugged cross Yes, indeed And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, you know, we will. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you.
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I place his name upon you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I bless you to be a blessing. I want to tell you, you were blessed coming in. You're blessed going out. You're blessed in everything you set your hand to this week. And I pray that this week we'll all be able to let our light so shine before others that they'll see our good works and consequently, as the word says, glorify our Father in heaven. The Lord bless you as you go today. You're dismissed on that note. Greet one another and uh, let, let everybody know you love. We're awfully glad to have you here today. The Lord bless you.